to see all of you as we gather here to worship the risen Lord at First United Methodist Church, where our mission is to share the hope of Christ from the heart of High Point. For those of you who are visiting with us for the first time today, my name is Josh Barnes. I'm the associate pastor here, and it is wonderful to gather with you in worship. Just want to bring a few announcements to your attention before we get started. The first is that today is the last day to register for our small group fellowship opportunity called Table Talk. And what Table Talk is, is really designed to be an opportunity for those of those of you who have maybe been visiting with us for a while, and you're ready to get to know a few more people, okay? It's a great opportunity for you to gather in a temporary small group setting and get to know more people in the church, okay? And get to know each other a little bit better. And so again, that's going to, that, what basically the way it's set up is that it's a monthly meeting with the same small group for three months, okay? And then you have the opportunity to switch Okay, and join and to reassimilate in, in another small group. Just gives you the opportunity to, again to build a network within the church of relationships and fellowship a little bit more. Okay, so again, if you would like to be a part of that, there's a tear off sheet as a part of our Connect card on the back of our Connect card. You'll see it says Table Talk that's attached to your bulletin. You can either turn that in today or you can also register on our website. Okay, also coming up. And back by popular demand is our biscuits and bingo. You're all chuckling, but you know you're excited. So that's coming up on the 26th from 6 to 8 o'clock. And anyone is invited to join, and it's open to anyone. You can come and, and be a part of that. I've been told it's aggressive bingo play, but it is, with, uh, it is in the spirit of fun. Okay, so... Um, come and be a part of that again. That's going to be on Friday from 6 to 8 in the Fellowship Hall. Also coming up on Sunday, all right, is, the, is our upcoming Community Corral concert. And the, that's going to be in here. I'm looking at Wesley because Wesley's the details on this. I got the details on this. 7 o'clock in the sanctuary. And any proceeds or donations, funds that we raise from that concert will go to support the YWCA. Okay? So come and be a part of that. Again, that's a week from today at 7 o'clock. Also, I have been asked to, uh, let, to let you know that coming up today at 2 o'clock, we will be ha um, having a celebration of life, a service of death and resurrection for Lily Mae El Eldridge. Let me get that right. Eldridge. Um, again, 2 o'clock, and that will be uh, between... Pastors Deborah Swing and myself, uh, 2 o'clock today in the sanctuary. Okay? Well, I, that, we, there are more announcements that you will find in your bulletin, but at this time, I want to turn it over to our chairperson of Staff Parish Relations Committee, SPRC, uh, Donna Parsons, who has a short message for us this morning. She's going to grab that mic. Good morning. Is it on? Okay. Um, well, you know that, you probably know that my uh, husband and I typically attend the 9 o'clock service, so when I'm here, I have something to share with you, <laughs> to tell you, and today it is, it is wonderful news. Um, as many of you know, the Book of Discipline of the United Methodist Church requires that pastors be appointed, every pastor be appointed one year at a time. So we have no guarantees after that year, but it is my privilege and um, my pleasure to announce to you that on behalf of the Western Conference that Reverend Willis Green and Reverend Josh Barnes have appoint been appointed to us for an additional year. <laughs> I, I don't want to speak out of, I don't want to speak for Willis, but I think I can that we're we're both grateful and thankful to have the opportunity to continue to serve you in ministry for the coming year. Um, I I know I've only been here ten months. In some ways, I feel like I'm just getting started. In other ways, I feel like I've known you for much longer. And so it's been a privilege to be among you and to continue to be with you as we serve in ministry together moving forward. 
Well, at this time, it remains for me to tell you, as Jesus told his disciples, that wherever two or three are gathered in the name of the risen Lord, there the Lord is as well. And so I say to you, the Lord be with you.
Let us stand. Let us join together for our greeting this morning. Through the waters. Through the waters, we die and rise to Christ. Through the waters. in Christ through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift. It is offered to us without price. I like to say it's on the house. It's on the house. Friends, it is a joy of mine this morning to introduce to you the Mao family. Um, Rusty, Selena, and big sister Luna have been faithful worshipers at the 9 o'clock service, and they wanted to share um, Leo's baptism with us at the 11 o'clock service. So we welcome you today, as they will be joining the church as well following the baptism. 
So it is really a privilege of mine to present Leo Murray for baptism. And so this is for you as his parents, answering on his behalf. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If you will, will you say, I do? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If you will, will you say, I do? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to, all peop to people of all ages, nations, and races? If you will, will you say, I do? Will you nurture Leo in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life. If you will, you say, I will. All right. Now, to you, the church. Do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Will you nurture one another in Christian faith and life and include Leah now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround you. We will pray for him and make him able to make his And now let us join together in professing the Christian faith as it's contained in the scriptures of the Old and the New Testaments. If you would, at this time, join with me as we affirm with the faith we find in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to th freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. So God, we ask this morning that you would pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water in Leo who receives it, to wash away his sin, clothe him in righteousness throughout his life, that dying and being raised with Christ, he may share in his final victory. 
all honor and glory is yours, almighty God. And all of God's people said, Amen. Leo, I want to tell you a little bit about our God. Our God is a creating God. And God began creation with creating the world and the sun and the moon. And then God went crazy and created all the animals, the duck-billed platypus and ladybugs and giraffes, and then filled it with plants like lilies and roses. And then, God made you. And God said, this is the best I can do. Made in my image. And so it is our joy today to baptize you into the family of Christ. And so Leo Murray, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Will you come and join us as we lay hands, and Josh will have a prayer. Why don't let's all touch Leo, okay? And we're going to pray over him. The Holy Spirit work within you that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. All right, Leo. It is now our joy. No, wait, get the camera. Get the light with me. Leo. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. So let your light so shine before others that say, will see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And so today we light your baptism candle. And we're going to invite your parents to take that home. And every year on April 21st, they can light that candle and remember the day that you were welcomed into God's family and baptized into the family of Christ. All right. Now, it is our joy to welcome our new brother in Christ, Leo Mallory, who will join together in the Eucharistic Church. You are baptism. You are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's around and introduce Leo and you'll get to see his big sister Luna. We're going to walk around so that you can see this beautiful new family. Now, Leo and Luna, what do you think of your family so far? Because I got to tell you, they're very impressed with you. They are very impressed with you. All right. <laughs> These are the people that will love you and care for you take care of you in the nursery, teach you in Sunday school, play with you in youth group. They will be right with you as you grow up as a child of God. Let me hold this hand. Now this is the time what I really want to do is disappear in the back and maybe not come back. <laughs> Mr. Joe, and they're the crowders. They're just going to love on you. And Doris and Rich, they're going to take care of you. We might let you hang out with Mary. <laughs> These are all the people that are going to love on you and teach you about Jesus. Yes, they are. Good job. 
Good job. You have been so happy. I bet you're ready to get back to Dad and Mom, though. <gasps> Look at that smile. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Wonderful. I can't remember uh, an infant who smiled so much during <laughs> baptism. He is, he is wonderful. Well, at this time, I'd also invite George and Julie Sanders to come up. George and Julie join us from another United Methodist congregation. And so at this time, we're going to invite them and then also Rusty and Selena and Luna to uh, join the church today. Okay? And so... As members of Christ's universal church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If you will, will you say, I will. As members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If you will, will you say, I will. Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care, and we pray that you would do all in your strength and your power to increase their faith, to confirm their hope, and to protect them in love. You will. We give, give thanks to all that God has already given you, and, and we, we welcome you to Christian love as, as members together. together. If you would, ladies and gentlemen of the church, would you please give them a round of applause as a welcome? And we invite the congregation to stand and to share the peace of Christ with those around you.
You may be seated. Well, at this time, we come now to a time of prayer, where we as the gathered body of Christ pray for the world that belongs to Christ. And so I would invite you to uh, take note of the prayer list that is in your bulletin for the coming week. I also have one update because I know many of you have asked. Um, many of you know that one of our staff here at the church, Amy Stevenson, has recently been diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And our most recent update that we've received from her is that she will be having surgery on May the 1st. So please note that, uh, take a mental note of it now, put it in your calendar, um, and, and remember to pray for Amy on that day, May the 1st. And in the days leading up to it, of course. Let us pray. Lord of the flood, through the sea you bear your people from slavery to freedom for life with you. Remind us gathered here today that we too are a people born of water and your spirit. Teach us to remember our baptism even in the most remote and ignored corners of our lives, so that this sacred childhood that we have in you would be manifest wherever we are and in whatever we do. Father, you send your rains on the just and the unjust alike, and by it you water this great garden that we call your creation. Water us too, Lord till and turn our hearts so that we can be trees planted by streams of your living water and bear our fruit in its season. God who makes all things new, renew your spirit within your church today and restore to us the joy of your salvation. By your spirit, retool and remake us into new wineskins, new creation so that we can convey, both from this place and everywhere in our lives, the fruit of our one true vine, Christ Jesus our Lord. For it is in his name that we pray as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. At this time, I invite our ushers to come forward as we prepare to receive this morning's tithes and offering. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, your grace and generosity spur us to grace and generosity in kind. And so we pray, Lord, that you would receive these gifts of tithe and offering into your church. May the spirit in whom we give them be your spirit, and the use to which we put them your use. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen.
seated. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verses 27 through 39. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi gave a great banquet for him in his house. And there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others sitting at the table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Then they said to him, John's disciples, like the disciples of the Pharisees, frequently fast and pray, but your disciples eat and drink. Jesus said to them, you cannot make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? The days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. And then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and sews it on an old garment. Otherwise, the new will be torn, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new wine, but says the old is good. This is the word of the Lord for all people. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Come, Holy Spirit, heavenly dove. Descend on us, reveal your love. Word of God and inward light, wake our spirits and clear our sight. Surround us now with all your glory. Speak through me your sacred story. Take my lips and make them bold. Take hearts and minds and make them whole. Stir in us your sacred flame and then send us forth to spread your name. Amen. Well, Jesus is at it again. He's hanging out with those sinners. He calls Levi, also known as Matthew, to come follow him. Levi leaves his lucrative business as a tax collector and then throws a party for Jesus and invites all of his tax collecting colleagues. Now, the Pharisees, those who maintained the religious laws, they didn't take too kindly to that. And they begin to question, why do Jesus and his disciples eat with sinners? And not only are they eating with sinners, but they are not fasting and praying with the same consistency and fervor of John's disciples. That's two strikes against them. So the Pharisees, they question these behaviors, this eating with sinners and this lack of fasting. And to answer their question, Jesus tells them a parable. Now, I know we usually think of parables as these long stories like the parable of the sower, the good Samaritan, the parable of the lost sheep, the prodigal son. But parables are not always long, drawn-out tales. They can also just be a couple sentences long. You see, a parable was a spiritual lesson that Jesus used to challenge his hearers to change their behavior. And the parable that Jesus shares is this. After the Pharisees have brought up these two ways in which Jesus is not following the old rules, Jesus says, No one tears a piece from a new garment and sews it on an old garment. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. I once heard a pastor tell about a time when he took a group of students on a mission trip to Nicaragua. They arrived in the capital city where they were going to spend the night before traveling north to their mission site. The next day was Sunday, so they went to church. The church was what I picture to be sort of like our modern day picnic shelters. It it had a roof, but no walls. 
except for one at the end that served as a backdrop, served sort of for the chancel and altar area, and there was a beautiful, colorful mural painted there. The mission team was told that after the sermon, there would be several infant baptisms. But these Americans, they were a bit perplexed because there was no baptismal font. There was no font like the one that we have here today. That There was no bowl on a stand. And so they thought, well, maybe someone will just walk out with a bowl of water and hold it. However, they were shocked when the time came from the baptisms and the pastor rolled out a small coffin filled with water. And the families came forward, and, and the pastor prayed over all the families. And then each family brought their infant up to the pastor, unwrapped the baby from its blankets, and handed the baby to the pastor naked as the day they were born. <laughs> the pastor then took each baby, held the baby up above his head, and said, Today you are dead to sin. And then he plunged that whole baby into that water in the whole coffin. And as he brought the baby up out of the water, he said, And today you are alive in Jesus. He did that with each baby, held it up. Today you are dead to sin. Then plunged the whole baby into the coffin of water, brought it up and said, And today you are alive in Jesus Christ. And the congregation, they were laughing and cheering. The music was jubilant. The families were clapping and beaming. And these beautiful naked babies were screaming. <laughs> now can you imagine that kind of baptism at First Methodist. <laughs> I'm not sure the Mao family would really appreciate that, but I thought about it. <laughs> Later, the pastor, as he reflected on this experience, the pastor said, theologically, it was brilliant. It was exactly right, because in baptism, we are dead to sin and alive only by the grace of God and Jesus Christ. Friends, we are um, three weeks on this side of Easter. And because of Easter and because of our baptism, we are all dead to sin. We are all alive in Jesus Christ. We, the people who follow the risen Christ, we are new. We are new because God makes all things new. But we got a problem here in Luke's gospel. Right here in Luke's gospel, we got a problem. There's some tension here. There's some tension between the old and the new. Between tradition and transformation. Tradition is important. Jesus never says otherwise. But Jesus and his disciples, you know what they're doing? They're not following tradition. They're not playing by the old rules. They are eating dinner with tax collectors and sinners. 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 These were the people who were expelled from the synagogues for moral and ritual reasons. And tax collectors, they were considered extortionists and thieves. These are the people who gathered burdensome taxes for the foreign power, Rome. Tax collectors were free to collect as much as they could in whatever way they could, as long as they brought part of it back to the Romans. If I was a tax collector, I could go out on a road and set up a booth. Apparently, that was the case with Levi, because the scriptures say that Levi was in a tax booth. I could set up a booth on a road and say, if you're coming through here, you have to pay, because this just became a toll road. I would probably invent like a toll tag, but still, this is now a toll road. And I'm going to take from you as much as I can, otherwise you may not pass. You see, we have to realize that when we see the words tax collector in scriptures, we need to think that these people were abhorred by their fellow Jews, abhorred detested and yet Jesus eats with them 
It is no wonder that the Pharisees ask, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Eating with them was unheard of because eating with someone meant full acceptance. Full acceptance. The fact that the question was even posed indicates that it was a very real question. Why, Jesus, why are you accepting such people? So when the question is asked of Jesus, why do you eat with them? Why do you accept them? It really addresses the very heart of Jesus' ministry. Why do you eat with them? Why do you accept them? This was at the very heart of Jesus' ministry. Now, I know in this scripture, it's sort of easy to point the finger at the Pharisees. Didn't we sort of grow up doing that? We even like teach the children, you know, oh, the Pharisees, they just didn't get it. They were so strict and they were all about obeying the rules. Not many people in the 8.30 and 9 o'clock service raised their hands. So I'm just going to survey this group, see if anybody sang this song. Anybody when you were little, did you ever sing that song? I don't want to be a Pharisee. Anybody? I don't want to be a Pharisee. Few over there. Because the Pharisees aren't fair, you see. I don't want to be a Pharisee. Yeah, I mean, that's how we, we, we think about the Pharisees that way. However, this is not a story about the Pharisees. It's a story about Jesus. The Pharisees come into the story like foils. They, they are there to throw a monkey wrench into the main character story, and the main character is Jesus. And so when they ask Jesus, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? In essence, they were saying this, why don't you follow our old rules? Why don't you follow our old traditions? Why don't you do what we've always done? Why don't you be a good Methodist? (laughs) But Jesus is changing everything. Not for the sake of change itself, but because what he is offering is something so new. Jesus is offering a new way of salvation. Salvation through grace, not keeping all the old rules like the Pharisees were attempting to do. Jesus is making all things new. And there is a problem when you try and mix the old ways with the new ways. And so Jesus tells them a parable in hopes that, in hopes that, remember what a parable does? It will challenge them to change their behavior. And so Jesus says, when you have a hole in your clothes, you cannot patch it with a new piece of cloth because the new cloth will be torn and it won't match the old. And when you have new wine, you don't pour it into old wineskins because the new wine, as it ferments, will burst the old wineskins. Jesus had not come to patch up the old religious system with its rules and regulations. He came to bring in something new, and I'm saying new with a capital N. The Pharisees prided themselves in knowing the law. They knew the law, but their legalism kept them from loving. And Jesus comes to show God's love, a love that is grace-filled and unconditional a love that brings him to touch and heal the lepers, a love that brings him to heal on the Sabbath, a love that brings him to to ask a scorned woman for a drink of water at the well, a love that brings him to the dinner table with tax collectors and sinners. What Jesus brings is so vital, it is so new, that it cannot be contained in the old rituals and the old forms of piety. Now hear this. Luke is not attacking the old. There is concern expressed about the loss of the old garment. Right? Read the scripture carefully. There is concern that the old garment will be torn. And there is concern about the old wineskin, concern that it will burst. There is concern for the old just as there is concern for the new. Each has its own integrity. 
But this new thing is so dynamic that it cannot be confined to the old ways, to the former rituals. And this new thing is being ushered in by Jesus himself. It is a new way to salvation. It's no longer dependent on keeping the laws. It is a gift given by a generous and gracious God. Jesus is making all things new, and that new should be spelled out in all caps, like a text message intended to be a shout. Just as the victorious Christ shouts in the book of Revelation, Behold, I am making all things new. Yesterday, about 65 of us gathered in the All Red Center for a discovery experience. It was a session led by the Reverend Nancy Rankin, who leads Transformation Journey. Transformation Journey is this process that the church is entering into to discover how to faithfully live into God's vision, which is that we would share the hope of Christ from the heart of High Point. We discussed different things like what makes a church vital and healthy. We shared strengths and opportunities for growth. And the one question that kept coming up, the one question that kept coming up, it was not this question. It was not what programs do we need to do next to get more children and youth in? It was not, what program do we need to do next to make the majority of our members happy? No, the question was, what is God calling us to be and to do for such a time as this? This is what God's vision asks of us. How is God calling us to share the hope of his resurrected son, Jesus Christ, here in High Point? Through Transformation Journey, we will be presented with some recommendations on how to do this. And if we choose to commit to those recommendations, the conference will supply us with expert guides, experts in the field. They'll provide us with resources. And we will embark on this transformation journey, taking the next faithful step forward to live into God's vision. As I walked around the room yesterday and sort of eavesdropped on some conversations, that's always fun for a pastor to do, there is no doubt in my mind that Jesus is doing a new thing here. That in the power of the resurrection, the Easter Jesus, he is on the loose. <laughs> he is transforming us even now to be more faithful as we carry out God's vision. Jesus is opening our minds to new possibilities, to new potential, and softening our hearts to release the old with gratitude. I appreciate the story that comes out of uh, Columbia Seminary. Columbia Seminary is a Presbyterian seminary in Atlanta. They were having a day-long retreat with all the trustees, administrators, faculty. They had a speaker there, a religious sociologist. He was talking about the future of theological education. You know, Seminaries do not have large graduating classes at this time. So they were discussing the challenges ahead for seminaries. They were presenting the different trends. And, and uh, he told the trustees and the, administrator, and the administration and the faculty that basically they needed to change a lot of what they were doing. At the end of the lecture, they had sort of a Q&A time. And one of the faculty asked this sociologist, what he thought was the greatest challenge ahead. And the speaker said, the greatest challenge that you have is recognizing that you need to change. And then he used an image, just like Jesus did, with the new and old cloth and the new and old wineskin. And the speaker said, you know, a lot of you, a lot of you professors and administrators, you are so comfortable you are so entrenched in this institution that you don't even realize that you're riding a dead horse. And one of the trustees piped up and said, you know, when the horse is dead, it's a great time to dismount. And Jesus says, no one tears a piece of a new garment and sews it with old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskin. Tradition is a gift. 
It is a gift. Tradition is living out the faith that our ancestors gave to us. Tradition is a good thing. However, when the love of tradition stands in the way of God making us new, that's when it becomes a problem. Then it becomes just going through the motions. It is doing things not because they have meaning, but we're doing them because we've always done it that way. And so the Pharisees asked Jesus, why? Why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why don't you follow our old rules, our old traditions? He simply couldn't. Jesus was doing a new thing. For our God is a God who is always doing a new thing. God is not a status quo God. God is not complacent with just the way things are. God is up to something new in this world, in this church, and in all of us. There is a fresh spirit blowing through First Methodist. God is doing a new thing right here on the corner of Richardson and Maine. And as God said through his prophet Isaiah, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Friends, this is a season filled with new opportunities, new discoveries, and my prayer as your pastor is that we will be open to the wooing of the Spirit. Because the risen Christ is making us new and making us as his body new. Remember, today you are dead to sin. And today, you are alive in Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Friends, I invite you after the choral benediction to come down and to greet our new members. Um, I'm sorry, George and Julie, you all have, like, have a baby, you know, like to compete with. You know, I'm sure everybody's going to want to come down and greet you all, but I think... <laughs> <laughs> right, so, uh, so please make your way down and welcome our new members in the family of Christ at First Methodist. Friends, go now in peace. In the name of the Father who gave us his Son, in the name of the Son who gave us his life, and in the name of the Holy Spirit who is with us now and forever. Amen. Amen.